Okay, thanks a lot for this very stimulating talk, uh, Professor Bogge. Um, I'm really interested how many immoral people uh, we'll have in the room and will we'll perhaps then stand up and uh, raise a couple of issues with you. But before we go into that debate, uh, I'd like to introduce our two commentators um, this, this evening. Um, the first is Christina Dietz from the Institute of Latin American Studies at the Free University in Berlin. And uh, Christina Dietz uh, will speak about the role of normative concepts in struggles over natural resources. She will do so uh, from the perspective of political ecology. Uh, she will also talk about the, the importance of socio-ecological struggles. Uh, Christina is a political scientist and researcher um, at the uh, Institute for Latin American Studies and she, her work focuses particularly on Latin America as you might already have um, imagined. After this um, comment, um, We'll have a second commentator, which is uh, Mrs. Isabel Feichtner. Uh, Mrs. Feichtner has studied law um, and is a lawyer uh, by, by profession um, in, um, in diverse countries in Europe and the United States and is now a junior professor for law and economics at the University, uh, Johann Wolfgang Goethe University in Frankfurt, um, Main. Her work focuses on the transnational law of natural resources and she has a current research project on the question of distributive justice in transnational resource law. So her, so her comment will um, particularly uh, include this legal dimension on, um, on questions of international resource politics. Um, I would like to ask you to uh, come up also to the podium, uh, first Christina and then uh, Ms. Feichner, and afterwards we go into the general discussion. So Christina, please, would you begin? Thank you, Werner, and um, thank you for the organizers, first for organizing the event and the conference, and second for inviting me to give some comments on the general topic of tonight's talk, but also related to the lecture that was given by Thomas Pocke. In my comment, uh, I want to address the question of justice and resource politics from a slightly different angle that is not from the view of global justice, but rather from the view of social inequalities, unequal power relations, structural conditions of resource politics, and concrete social struggles. I start from the assumption that such a perspective is important, first, in order to understand the social and political economic foundations of injustices in resource politics. That means that when we want to address the issue of justice in resource politics, I assume that we first need to ask ourselves why and what is injustice or what is the unjust issue related to um, resource politics. And second, um, in order to draw more concrete um, conclusions for political action. What is obvious and has become quite clear from Thomas Pogger's lecture is that the use of access to the control over resources as well as the benefits of the extraction of resources and the valuation in the world market are highly unevenly distributed. <coughs> highly uneven distributed means between the global north and the global south, but also among societies themselves. That means that even amongst the global poor, we can observe substantial inequalities in relation to the distribution of the access to resources and to benefits. These inequalities are mainly based on intersected social relations of class, gender, race, ethnicity, but also on differences between geographical localities, urban, rural differences, for example. If we start from struggles, we can observe that current struggles over resources that we can find all over the place in the global south and the global north. For example, struggles against the expansion of open pit mining in Senegal, in Ghana, in the Philippines, in Indonesia or in Argentina, mostly or quite often related to the expansion of the appropriation of so-called unconventional gas and oil deposits, the so-called fracking but also struggles related to labor issue in resource extraction um, practices relate to these different kinds of inequalities 
and are based on the way social actors perceive and interpret, interpre interpret these social inequalities as being unjust. From the viewpoint of the oppressed, be them workers, rural landless people, peasants, indigenous groups, black communities, migrant workers or women's groups, claims for social justice within these struggles over resources function as powerful mobilizing discourses for political actions. Within these struggles, depending on the social situatedness of the actors involved, but also on the scale where claims for justice are being made, different notions and dimensions of social justice compete with each other. For example, claims for just distribution of resource revenues and benefits compete with claims for recognition of territorial sovereignty or with, the, uh, with um, claims for representation and political decision making or with claims for better working conditions. Today, and under the current boom of resources, or what Maristela Spampa from Argentina calls the commodities consensus, resource politics, as colleagues like Har Harvard Harstad um, points out clearly, appears as one of the main arenas where competing notions and claims for justice clash. Um, a very good case in point are struggles over resources in Latin America that are being related to something that is called neo-extractivism, um, a term that tries to frame a certain development model based on the extraction, export, exportation and valuation of resources and the use of revenues coming from these extraction of resources for improving living conditions of the poor. And also, many democratically legitimized governments in the region nowadays appropriate rents coming from resource extraction in order to redistribute these rents in order for, for improving living conditions for the, social, for the, for the uh, poor parts of, the, of, their, uh, of their population. Also, this is happening. Struggles and complaints are not disappearing, they're even re-emerging on the base of different claims of justice. <coughs> they, they are, this, this is, that, that leads me to the, to the reflection that also there are processes of redistribution. We have newly emerging struggles and continuing struggles that focus on other aspects related to resource extraction. For example, to the reordering of social structures and institutions that have regulated access and distribution of resources before a certain practice or form of nature appropriation like mining or open pit mining um, has expanded. Or that leads to the very, like, let's say, like overall transformation of landscapes when turning peasant farm lands into monocultural crop production um, for palm oil, for example. These examples show that the question of justice and resource politics is much more complex. It's not only about the distribution of benefits, of paying a compensation to those who cannot make use of their right to land because the land is being converted into a mine, for example. I think that in order to make sense of the notion of justice in resource politics, these complexities need to be taken into account and need to be disentangled in order to reveal power relations relations and social inequalities that are linked to resource politics at and between different scales. In line with other scholars, I therefore argue for a multidimensional understanding of social justice as proposed by feminist thinkers, for example, Iris Young or Nancy Fraser, who differentiates at least three dimensions of justice that are nevertheless intricately interlinked in practice, which is redistribution, recognition and representation. I'm highlighting the multidimensionality of justice because I'm a little bit afraid that a minimal and universal notion of global justice 
as, be, has, as Thomas Pogges has proposed it, runs the risk to hide rather than to reveal the complex social inequalities and power relations inscribed in resource politics. That leads me to my second and last argument. These inequalities that I had, have referred to and that constitute, from my point of view, the basis for claims for justice, they do not just exist, they're not just there. But they are, as Thomas Pogge rightly pointed out, uh, are historically rooted. They're socially produced and reproduced across time and space and con con uh, constantly. One so an important arena for the production and reproduction of social relations of power, domination and inequalities are actually resources. But not just resources as such, but rather the ways they are socially produced, known, appropriated, culturally represented and transformed within and across national boundaries. I do not claim that all forms of resource appropriation are per se unjust. Humans, and here I refer to Marx, humans need to appropriate and transfer nature and natural resources in order to meet existential needs, like alimentation, housing, mobility, etc. What matters are the conditions and constellations, that is the social forms and practices under which nature is appropriate, appropriated by whom, in which way, and for what. Under capitalism, and nowadays, I would say, most regulations of social nature relations are being uh, dominantly um, uh, um, capitalist forms of regulations. Resources are mainly being appropriated not because of their use value, but because of their exchange value. And that has widespread implications. First, in order to turn resources into a commodity, private property rights or ownership rights, or rights of temporary use at least, needs to be established through different mechanisms. And these mechanisms are not only illegitimate, these are mechanisms that are being brought forward by democratically elected governments and their administrations. For example, when the Argentinian government is now trying to reformulate a mining law in order to make it easier for capital investors to extend uh, mining activities. The same is happening when we look at forest protecting laws in uh, Brazil, for example. Other mechanisms of establishing private property rights are processes of privatization, dispossession and um, other forms of normalization. <coughs> second, the second uh, implication, second, as long as capital can be valorized through turning nature into commodities, this process of reproduction of social inequalities based on class and other issues are, is continuing. And it seems as if in times of crisis of capitalism, this form of capital valorization is even expanding, fueled by an intensification of a growth-orientated fossil fuel-based mode of production in capitalist centers, centers themselves, so maybe here, and in other parts of the capitalist semi-peripheral um, semi -per um, in the global south as well as by a deepening and expansion of what Ulrich Brandt and Markus Wissen call imperial mode of living. My argument here, to make that clear, is that when we talk about justice in international resource politics, I, I, I want to highlight that we should not be mute about the modes of production and consumption and related forms of resource appropriations that prevail in capitalism. As long as the social struggles revolving around resources remain weak or do not lead to profound transformations of these modes of production and consumption, resource politics remain the politics of capital. And the idea of a global resource dividend or a global resource tax might remain an illusion. 
who would actually have, under capitalist conditions, an interest in implementing such a GRD, especially in times of bare-buckled geoeconomic struggles over access and prices related, for example, to oil, as we can uh, um, observe right now uh, um, in, uh, related to the discussions of the, um, the OPEC. What remains from my point of view is to strengthen social struggles and to find a powerful, dynamic and persuasive way of relating the multiple notions of social justice to those struggles over resources. Because if resource politics become more just or become more fair, it's not primarily, from my point of view, a question of debate around different aspects of justice, but of social struggles. Thank you. <laughs>